Two and a half weeks later, none other than George Washington arrives on the scene. And, George, and you know, this is not the George Washington that looks at us from the dollar bill. This is a George Washington in his 40s. He is young, he is fired up, he is a, and he wants to attack the British in Boston. Because when he sees this army, he is not impressed. <laughs> These New Englanders are very different from the way they, they make them down in Virginia, a largely hierarchical society where people know their place. And when orders are delivered, orders are followed. In New England, the, the typical response to an order from an officer is, thanks to the town meeting, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> we will discuss whether we want to do what you have just asked us to do. And if we agree with that, we would be happy to comply. This attitude drove Washington nuts. Uh, how am I going to make a professional army out of this group of militiamen who, you know, do not think of themselves as a part of a glorious cause. They think of themselves as from Massachusetts and, or New Hampshire or Connecticut. And if you're from Connecticut, you don't like the people from Massachusetts. Or, you know, it's, it's, this, is, they are, this is groups of tribes that have ancient hatreds and, and alliances. And, to, and for them to think outside of their ver what they see as a very personal beef with the British crown is very difficult. And yet this is where Washington begins the, that slow work of taking a group of people who had never thought of themselves as anything larger than really the residents of the town, which they call home, makes them begin to think of themselves as something out of perhaps what might be a new country. Um, the, the Washington has a lot of challenges, uh, not only recruitment and, and re-enlistment, but his artillery regiment has been an embarrassment, uh, particularly on the Bunker Hill. Uh, uh, many of the officers fled in panic. He needs to clean house. He needs a new officer to apply a whole new um, approach. And it's in September of 1775 when he uh, is inspecting the fortifications in Roxbury that he meets a young 25-year-old officer, former bookseller, God bless booksellers, <laughs> uh, named, named Henry Knox. Uh, Henry Knox admits that everything he knows about the military he read in the books in his bookstore. Um, uh, he is uh, about as tall as Washington, but, uh, but roly-poly ha and has that twinkle in his eye. You know, he just has something, has a spark. And Washington begins to wonder, is this the guy to take over the artillery regiment? And he, he discusses this with, with John Adams, and, um, and uh, who's at the Continental Congress. And, and um, he begins to think, yes, this might be the man. But he also knows that if he announces this to this army, that will create a firestorm. You do not put a 25-year-old, you know, make a 25-year-old colonel head of the artillery. There are plenty of men who consider them the obvious choices. So before this is announced, Washington sends Henry Knox on a secret operation. What they need more than anything, he can't attack the British because he doesn't have enough gunpowder and he doesn't have the cannons he needs to dislodge them from that, the city. 300 miles to the northwest at the southern tip of Lake Champlain is Fort Ticonderoga where there are more than 20 tons of cannons. This is exactly what he needs but it's 300 miles away. So in November, he sends Henry Knox and his younger brother, William, who make their way to New York City and then up the Hudson and ultimately to Fort Ticonderoga. And there they begin to construct huge wooden sleds, sledges, and round up herds of oxen and horses and wait for it to snow. The snow falls. They load up the cannon on these huge sledges. And the caravan begins making its way down the frozen Hudson River uh, at Albany. One of the larger cannon falls through the ice. Uh, the residents of Albany help them retrieve the cannon. After, after this, the, uh, uh, that cannon is known as the Albany. 
and then they make their way across the entire width of Massachusetts. Going up the hills, uh, going up the mountains in the Berkshires was tough, but going down was really where it was difficult, where the sledges threatened to overrun the oxen. And yet, somehow, by the end of January, Henry Knox delivers all of these cannons to the town of Framingham. By this time, the announcement has been made. The predicted firestorm has raged. Many officers have threatened to resign. But now, everyone has to admit that this 25-year-old kid is capable of wonders. 